Our commencement speaker this year is Dean Emeritus James Tamus. Dean Tamus has worked for two major companies during his very successful career and is now a consultant to the industry. He is the founding dean of the School of Hospitality and served as the dean for 15 years. He retired as Dean Emeritus and is currently on several private and public advisory boards within the hospitality industry. Dean Stamus raised the funding needed to create this beautiful Shah building that you just spent four years in. He was also instrumental in making the School of Hospitality an independent entity within the university. These are all incredible achievements. Personally, I am really grateful for his counsel, advice, and a warm welcome when my appointment was announced early in 2013. Dean Stamus reached out to me and offered any help I would need to make a successful transition. He held true to his word and has been available to me as and when I have reached out to him. So please welcome Dean Stamus. I'm going to have to remind if I ever do this again, uh, don't follow the student speaker. It's a, it's a bad act, a tough act to follow. <laughs> Congratulations, that was magnificent. And thank you, Arun. Thank you, Arun, for your very generous introduction. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, as I prepared, two thoughts came to mind. The first was that I met many of you and your families when you were anxious high school students or prospective transfer students looking and considering colleges and universities. I remember well that most of you just wanted to get the process over with. You were fed up with it. Many of you worried that you might not get into the school of your choice. At Boston University, we also wanted to get the process over with. And the big dark secret was that we were just as worried that you, as you that you might not accept our offer. Thank you for doing so. My second thought was a friend's reference to an article in the Wall Street Journal entitled, The Last Lecture. It told of universities that were holding a series of last lectures by retiring professors. Maybe, symbolically, this is my last lecture. If so, it's appropriate that it be with you. So here goes. People who give commencement addresses are advised to recount their career as a basis for their message and to remember that the message is also for parents and guests. I truly hate talking about myself, but I'll honor that recommendation in the hopes that it makes the message clearer. I'll also follow a practice at, comm at commencement of the various schools within the university to leave world issues to tomorrow's speaker and concentrate on what I've learned along the way that can help your career and your life. My journey, it's very different than yours, has been and will be. I was a liberal arts major without a career direction. I went into the army after college, came out married, and soon thereafter had our first child. On to graduate school, came out at a bad time for the economy, and gladly, and I underlined gladly, accepted the only job I could find that was with a major electronics company at an hourly wage, interviewing people who were leaving the company to determine why. I loved it. I was lucky. I found a boss who saw something in me, nurtured it, gave me opportunities, several promotions, but became restless. By then, we had three children and become rooted to where we were. I started looking around and heard of a job with a Boston hotel company, then called Hotel Corporation of America, which later became Sinesta Hotels. It was in their corporate office. It was also a job that I really was not qualified for, but somehow got, again, lucky. I loved the company and eventually became its chief HR officer and thought I'd spend my career with that company. But owner's interest changed, resulting in a need to move on. By then, our family objectives were clear as a bell. Family first, relocation, right or wrong, was not for us. I passed on opportunities that even today, friends think 
was a mistake, but I don't. I went to work for a New England hotel company, Dunphy Hotels, then I went on to become Omni Hotels, first as their HR director and eventually as their chief administrative officer, from which I retired to become a consultant to the industry. Both hotel companies were family operated. Both added to my understanding that even with limited financial resources, you could compete through your people. Both emphasized the importance of teams and team leaders. Both invested heavily in organizational development. Friends and associates in those companies went on to become presidents of at least eight companies, including your own Professor Troy. Others went on to populate the industry at senior level positions. At the same time, I was chairing the executive board of a major business school and the advisory board to this school. I was shocked when asked to become our school's first dean, which I twice declined, but eventually accepted. In my arrogance, and I underline arrogance, I accepted the job for three years, thinking that's all I needed to transform the school to one of importance within the university and one that married exceptional education and work experiences to the direct needs of the industry. 15 years later, not three, <laughs> I retired. I tell you all this in preparation for my last lecture. My career is a product of reacting to opportunities that accommodated our family life goals. I was lucky it worked out. So what did I learn during my journey that might be useful to you? During my journey, a number of things happened that changed our industry forever. First, when I joined the industry, companies mostly owned what they operated, requiring huge capital investments to grow. Recognizing this, companies began to manage for others and franchising for a fee and eventually doing it all over the world. In many cases, and believe me, managing for others was certainly not as rewarding as running your own hotels that you own and operate, but it was a way to grow and the industry certainly did. Secondly, over my journey, countries evolved, borders disappeared, markets emerged, and people around the world found the desire and the means to do business and visit places they could only dream of. Today, Starwood and Intercontinental, for example, operate in over 100 countries, Hilton in 88, Marriott in 73, et cetera, et cetera. Starwood is opening a hotel every two weeks in China, Marriott one a, one a week in Asia, and even more in the United States and around the world. Branded hotel companies today manage over seven and a half million hotel rooms around the world. And most believe our industry to be the largest non-governmental industry in the world, and once again, it's growing. Thirdly, technology developed that made travel more available, reservation systems that immediately connected people to destinations, identified customer needs and expectations in great detail, assess company opportunities in relation to company capabilities, and very important to you, measure the performance of teams and individuals in real time. Fourth and finally, after fighting the war to differentiate, pro to differentiate products by architecture, amenities, slogans, rewards programs, et cetera, et cetera, the war is now at the level of service by people to people. So where are we today? Our industry remains among the most competitive in the world, enormous costs to create, high fixed costs to operate, usually a death knell for many businesses, but ours is prospering. Our industry is doing well, and one reason it's doing well has profound implications to you. Many of them have learned to look for people and value people 
who can lead, quote unquote, people, not people who manage or direct people. That's the way most of them have found to get the necessary top line, bottom line, and satisfy customers. In a nutshell, that's your job, whether you're a team member or you're a team leader. So how do you become a contemporary leader? I believe the most important thing you can do is right now, while you've been doing it, accept the responsibility for career decisions that prepare you for leadership positions in the three phases, stages of your career, starting out, moving up, and in its maturity. Some advice. One, starting out, get a beginning in the best job you can find. Show them what you got, get experience. Diversify that experience. Look for mentors and get all the feedback you can. Use the experience and feedback to get realistic but flexible goals. Two, in every stage of your career, consider the opportunities that will surely come your way. Your resulting decisions will be sometimes easy to make, at other times difficult, because they may conflict with personal and family lifetime objectives. Real or imagined, but they may conflict with what your family wants to do. Think it through. Don't be afraid to say yes, but also don't be afraid to say no. Just know why you're doing so, and then live with it. And don't look back. Three, figure out what you're good at and what you like to do. Seek to strengthen every team you become part of and mentor others. I believe personally, you can never become a good team leader unless you've been a good team member. When you do, you'll feel good about yourself and treasure the respect you get from others. Ed Fuller, chair of our school's advisory board, taught us that, quote, you can't lead with your feet on the desk. I'll add that you can't lead, quote, if no one will follow. Fourth, know what's going on around you. What are you hearing from your bosses? What are you hearing about your team's performance? And what are they saying about your future? Listen in the same way as you would advise a brother, a sister, or your best friend to look for and listen to feedback uh, from their workplace. Fifth, somewhere along the line, you'll be challenged to, quote, change the world, or, quote, that lousy company culture. When inclined to do so, my advice is, remember, it's not a God-given right. You have to earn it. When you've earned it, use it carefully, be strategic, take what you can get and live to fight another day. But what you can always do is be the boss you wish you had at every point in your career. And finally, and I almost took this out, but when you've made it big, when you're running the show, remember that somebody probably just joined your company from Boston University School of Hospitality who thinks you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> Believe it, and they might be right. <laughs> to conclude, first to parents and guests. Some of you were worried that your son and daughter pursued too specialized a degree. Don't, I hope by now you realize, don't worry. The breadth and the depth of their education is such they can apply it anywhere and will in the hospitality industry and outside of it. They know it. The graduates, you guys, my last class, do it your way, not mine. You're better prepared. You went to a great university, and let me tell you, Arun is absolutely right. 
This is the best hospitality school that I know of, and I'm associated with three of them. You've come out at a great time for career opportunities. Four years ago when you came here, it wasn't. Enjoy your journey and take all the luck that comes your way. I hope you find mentors, become a great team member and leader. And I emphasize again, seek to mentor young people. Someday when you are asked to deliver a commencement address, I believe you will describe a journey and an evolving industry that makes my description seem simplistic. I wish you every success, personal happiness, and hope your journey becomes personally and professionally as rewarding as mine has been to me. And for what might, and again, I want to put a big line under might, hope that my last lecture is helpful to you. I will enjoy hearing and reading about you and be able to say with great pride that I knew you when. Thank you.